Hi guys, iPhone Dane here because camera's broken. Uh, and today I'm gonna to be doing a review, or at least making a start of my review, of The Bedding of Boys by Edward Lorne. So I've read a few of Edward Lorne's books at this point. My girlfriend reads them first and then I read them after because she's become a big fan of his after reading Life After Dane, uh, which is my first Edward Lorne. Uh, as always, I'm gonna read you the blurb, then I'm gonna go through it and check out my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads The Bedding of Boys. Regina Corsi is a monster, the vilest of predators. Her desire for young boys is only matched by the bloodlust that overcomes her once the sex is finished. But she's grown hasty in her hunting, and only a special friend can keep her disturbing appetites a secret. Nevada Barnes is 14 and, emotionally speaking, still very much a child. When his stable home life is thrown into turmoil by an unexpected visitor, he escapes into the arms of an older woman, where he will find his own desire growing stronger each and every day. In the small town of Bay's End, Regina and Nevada dive headfirst into a relationship doomed for disaster, a sex fueled madness neither will be able to satiate. But Regina's special friend is impatient and will not be distracted by their love affair. It will feed, whether Regina wills it to or not. For the bedding of boys has consequences that reach far behind the legal ramifications of her actions. When ghost is hungry, only death will do. So let's go through and check out some tabs. So we start off with a pretty decent scene where, um, where what's her name? I've already forgotten her name. What was her name? Uh, Regina is, uh, is killing a child. And we get this, which I think is just beautifully written, very well done. All of the gore scenes in this are done well, but there's, they're also can occasionally be kind of philosophical. She placed her ear to his chest and listened to his heartbeat, faint and ever lessening, the space between each beat growing further and further apart. Shock was a wonderful thing. It eased the worst of pain and numbed the body to prepare for the passing of the soul. The evacuation of that soul to her was the most beautiful thing in all of existence. She reached up and ran her gory fingers through his sweat damp hair. Another great little observation here. The mother seemed heavier than Regina might be able to manage. Why were the dead always so much heavier than the living? We get this little line. It's like that movie about the kids and the railroad tracks. Stand by me, dad asked. And uh, yeah, that's a, a based on a Stephen King novel. Uh, it's based on the body, well, it's a novella. Um, and we get a lot of little Stephen King references in Edward Lorne's books because he's a big fan. So Nevada's dad says, uh, well, Nevada says 10 years is a long time and, and his dad goes, not really, I've seen 10 years come and go almost four times. Imagine that. Me too, man, me too. It's basically they're digging up this uh, time capsule and one of the things they find is uh, a cassette tape with Hotel California by the Eagles on it, which is weird because as I was reading that part of the book, um, I'd been watching um, a YouTuber, I can't remember which one now, We're On The Move, I think, who uh, are like can canal boat people, um, but they'd just been to see an Eagles tribute band and we were chatting about the Eagles because I've seen the, the Eagles, the actual Eagles, and uh, that he finds a plastic clown in the, uh, in the pile as well. And we get, Nevada picked it out and shivered involuntarily. He wasn't deathly afraid of clowns, but they did make him uneasy. Part of his fear stemmed from a trailer he'd seen, not even a full feature film, but a stupid two minute trailer for a movie called It. In the trailer, a wicked looking clown rose from what looked to be a flooded cellar. A jump cut to the clown rushing toward the screen and Nevada had slung his smartphone across the room. Forget that nonsense. Uh, and obviously that's a reference to a Stephen King book as well. We get quite a few references to Stephen King throughout Lorne's books, uh, which you would expect because in his YouTube video videos, he's often done videos where he, you know, pulls out all of the times that King referenced other King books. Oh, uh, Nevada has uh, Grandpa Nick, who he used to call Fishy Papa. Um, and we get, Nevada said, why did I call him that? I mean, I remember calling him Fishy Papa because he fished, but why couldn't I say something as simple as Nick? Well, you could, but it came out as Grandpa Nicker instead of just Nick, and we didn't want... Nevada's eyes popped wide. He shook a hand at his mother. Oh no, I get it. Wow, no wonder you didn't want me saying that. I said N-I-C-K-E-R, by the way, just to clarify. Don't cancel me, please. August um, has one of his seizures, and we get... He went, rig he went rigid and toppled, landing half in and half out of the kitchen, his legs poking from the house like the Wicked Witch of the East's legs from under Dorothy's house. Um, and it's just fun because I've been reading the Wizard of Oz series, so it's fun to see like a crossover between the books that I'm reading. And uh, just a great little paragraph here. Uh, we're going to Regina here. She wasn't expecting company. Despite the breakfast food she'd just eaten, it was three in the afternoon, and not even religious sorts knocked on doors this time of day. They came in the morning when people's minds were vulnerable with sleep and thoughts of killing themselves. No one who worshipped God killed themselves in the middle of the afternoon. Just wasn't done. That's because the sun makes you sane. When it's directly overhead, no one considers taking their own life. Everything is bright and life is full of sunny possibilities or some shit. I've noticed a typo just as I was reading that as well. It says when people's mind were vulnerable instead of when people's minds were vulnerable. 
And here we get some history of Bay's End, which is fun, because again, all, all of Lorne's books tie together in a similar way to how all of King's books tie together. In 1932, Francis Bay and his wife Marietta were burned at the stake in the centre of town. Their murders were the last of their kind in America. Shortly after that, the town was thusly named Bay's End. Correcting people who thought the apostrophe in the town's name was a typo was a rite of passage for every citizen. No, it's supposed to be a possessive apostrophe. Okay, thanks, bye. We get this little conversation between Wally and Nevada. Um, he shook his tablet at Tommy. You read that book I sent you? Tommy fell into a heavy southern accent. You know I can't read good, Wally. I've been trying to tell you there. Did you read it or not, Tommy? Calm down, I read it. Did the dog have to die? Dude had rabies, Tommy. What did you expect to happen? Yeah, but the kid died too. The kid lived in the movie. So you liked it enough to watch the movie? Tommy shrugged. It was on Netflix. Why not? Another just a great line here. The boys raced out into the road with a reckless abandon of children who've not tasted the bitter pill of tragedy. We get a reference to Joking Hazard, the cyanide and happiness game, which I thought was quite fun. Uh, it's kind of n nerd culture, I guess, but it was fun. <laughs> but the, the kids in it were impressed that the older woman knew what it was. And I'm kind of impressed that he knew what it was, especially if you consider when this book came out. That was like brand new at the time as well. I love this as well. A guy's wearing a black t-shirt with white lettering that says, my t-shirt is brighter than your future. I just thought that was quite funny. I kind of want that t-shirt. Here we get a little bit about Nevada's reading, uh, reading preferences um, and also his thoughts on, on reading from an e-reader, which I agree with. I mean, I, I only read physical books. Nevada grabbed Brandon Sanderson's Calamity from the three-tier bookshelf in his room, which was loaded with sci-fi and fantasy books by classic authors like Heinlein, Dick and Moorcock, and even modern authors like Scalzi and Rothfuss, as well as Sanderson. His parents were good about buying him the newest from his favourite authors on release days, so his shelves were full of hardcovers. He had a few paperbacks, but mostly those were the classics from the guys who were either dead or not publishing anymore. The only old book he had a hardcover of was Frank Herbert's Dune. That one didn't have a dust jacket, hadn't had one when he'd found it at a yard sale years back. He'd read that particular book four times and still wasn't tired of it. Didn't think he could, ever could be tired of it. He tried books on his iPhone, but the screen was so small. And when he increased the size of the font, he felt like he was doing more page swiping than reading. So he'd given up on the format. Plus, paper books, real books, as he was fond of saying, didn't require charging. And his phone barely kept a charge as it was. Imagine if he used it to read too. He'd never have enough batteries to so much as text someone. And uh, I have a fear is a mind killer quote on my arm from, uh, from June. We get a reference to the county sheriff, the one that had taken over for Jenna Wales when she'd gotten killed in a shootout a few years back. Uh, and that happened in one of the other books that we have read. Uh, I think that was in The Sound of Broken Ribs, but I couldn't couldn't be sure. Um, we get a reference to Blake Crouch's Dark Matter, another book that I've read. And uh, we get another crossover as well, a uh, reference to uh, the author guy from that, uh, Donald Adams. Uh, it says... Must have been five or six years ago by now, she'd seen the guy on the news. He'd written several scary books under a pen name and had done a press conference outing himself. Um, but also we get um, this other thing. Up until now, she'd had some preconceived notion that any adult under four feet tall should sound like the munchkins from The Wizard of Oz. This guy sounded strangely enough like that dwarf on one of her favourite shows, Game of Thrones. I hadn't noticed it at the time, but now going back through it, I realise that's the second Wizard of Oz reference. We get a reference to uh, Jude Lance's father, Harold Hap Carringer. Um, and the death of Eddie Tremont, which happened in one of the other books, uh, as well as a reference to Dane Peters, um, which is fun. I'm going to read you this, this whole little paragraph here. Back in the early 90s, Jude Lance's father, Harold Hap Carringer, had driven his car off this very cliff. He'd taken a boy named Eddie Tremont with him. What a stink that had caused. Regina could remember the town's reaction clearly. Either people refused to talk about it, thinking that their acquaintance and or association with Hap made them, by default, a terrible person themselves, or they wouldn't shut up about how he'd been such a good guy. Weren't they all good guys, though? Ted Bundy, Dane Peters, John Wayne Gacy, Ramirez, Raider, especially Dennis Raider, the infamous church-going serial killer who came to be known as BTK. Hap's illegitimate sons, one of them a beloved Bayes End police officer, and the other the paedophile Jude Lance, whom Regina herself had had a sexual relationship with before her taste changed with age and maturity, had terrorised the unsuspecting town for years. And Papa Hap had covered it all up, going so far as to hide a body for his bad cop son, Mac Larson. And we get a reference to the opening of the film Dreamcatcher, again another movie based on uh, Stephen King's books. We get, uh, they're watching videos on the dark web on tour as well, again, that tickled my, my nerd bone. I actually was explaining what Tor was and how the dark web worked to my, my grandparents at Christmas. I don't think they really understood it. Uh, and we get a Spongebob reference, which is fun because Shay and I have been watching a lot of Spongebobs. Spongebobs? Yeah, well, I guess that's the plural for the episodes. 
Tommy's guest bathroom was a study in yellow, pink and green. Nevada was always reminded of SpongeBob SquarePants when he used the toilet in here. He kept expecting Squidward to poke his head in and ask him if he wanted cheese on his Krabby Patty. He shook off, zipped up and flushed the toilet, all while thinking about Squidward and chuckling. We get a reference to Regina listening to Trivian. Good band. See, saw those live. I saw them live in uh, 2005. Download 2005. On my 16th birthday. Another great line here. You don't keep secrets for fun. You keep secrets to keep your ass out of trouble. So August texts Tommy. Hope you're all right, man. Call me. Let me know you're okay. He didn't notice his improper use of your until after he hit send. Wasn't that always the case? No. You just use the right your, mate. And so we get this little bit of exposition from... Um, from Becky, who is in fact Regina. Back in the 90s, there was this guy named Jude Lance. He was a kiddie fucker. He liked all kinds of kids. Kids of all ages didn't matter. Dude would fuck anyone and anything. I believed then and I still believe now. He just liked to come. There were dozens of us strewn around town. Some he found through friendships with his two sons and others he actively stalked. I was one of those. I'd see him in the gas station after school, reading the paper, at the mall, sitting on a bench. And sometimes he'd be walking down my road right about the time I'd be outside playing. One day he stopped and talked to me. This was shortly after my tits started sprouting. My hormones were all fucked up, raging like nobody's business. He was handsome. He said he wanted me and I wanted him. So I started sleeping with him while my parents were at work. Didn't take long before I found out I wasn't the only one. When the secret was out between me and him, he started bringing other kids into what he called family time. Some of us were made to fuck each other as well as him. Both of his sons, even the retarded one, got to fuck me while he watched or participated. So there, now you know. And Nevada says, I'm sorry. And she says, I don't like it when people apologize for shit they didn't do. And I, I kind of get that, yeah. And then the end, probably what the last little bit of it anyway, is all about, um, is all about August. And we learn uh, that he was born with a call, an amniotic membrane over his face, uh, which used to say, it used, people used to say that meant that they've got the gift of second sight. Sorry, I just covered my face there. I miss my camera. Right, it's coming back. I'm getting a new one soon. All right, this just did my fruit and assumingly not wanting to touch him, she snapped a branch from one of the sickly trees and used it to lift his sheet. Assumingly, that is horrible. I hate uh, adverbs. And then we've got, um, what's her name? Regina's out with Nevada. And we have this thought, which is fairly true. Were there people watching them? This obviously older woman with this obviously young man, this obviously underage boy, probably. But no one would say anything. They'd just turn up their noses and whisper about how disgusting she was. Let this have been a grown man and an underage girl. Someone would have stepped in, she was sure. Let this have been Jude Lance and her circa 1991. Let that have been the case and you wouldn't have been able to beat off her saviours with a machine gun. That's the way of this broken world. Women are born fragile and in need of protection. Men are born strong and do the protecting. What a load of shit. Que sera, sera. And yeah, what I will say is that the end of this book was a bit of a letdown. The stuff going into uh, August, I wasn't too interested in. I understand why it was there, because it kind of rounded off the story, but you almost didn't need it. Um, you know, in fact, you almost didn't need the supernatural elements of ghosts. It's, it's kind of scarier without the supernatural elements, and it's just the evil that people do, you know? Um, and then there was, like, this bit right at the end, um, which I didn't understand. Like, who the fuck is Belinda? Was I supposed to know who Belinda was? Because if I was... I, I, I didn't. Um, but other than that, I did really enjoy The Bedding of Boys by Edward Law. And as you can see from the sheer amount that I shared from this, uh, it was shaping up to be maybe even a 4.5 out of 5, but it's that ending let it down a little bit. So it's a 4 out of 5 for me, but still very good. Probably my favourite of all of the Edward Law that I've read so far. Check it out. So there we have it. That's what I made of The Bedding of Boys by Edward Law. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more. And I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.